Tom, welcome to the RSA National Office. Thanks for yep. taking the time to join us today. My pleasure. Yeah. So the book, I've read it, uh, and mm. I read it in three days. It's obviously the result of a lifelong passion for you. Yep. Your influence has come through to that, right through to the dust jacket with the um, World War II comic style mm. of, uh, of cover. Um, what was it about the Charlie Upham story that has driven you to, I guess, throw in your job uh, and, and pursue this uh, book? I read, well, I first read Mark of the Lion as a teenager, and I read it one night, not three days. I'm much more disciplined than you. I read it overnight, and I was staggered and amazed, and it made me feel, I felt a terrible surge of patriotism mm. that, you know, that New Zealand had produced a man like, excuse me, Charlie Upham, and years later, I only felt that again when I read about Edmund Hillary and, and people like Peter Snell. I, I've, I've got this sort of soft spot for Kiwi male heroes. Mm. And I, I just just couldn't believe the scale of Charlie's courage. You know, it, the, it's big as disbelief, really, just to be that brave that often and for that long is just staggering. Mm. And I always wondered, where did it come from? Where did all that courage come from? Where did that moral fiber and that moral courage as well as physical courage come from? So I, I wanted to explore that. And when I started writing a, a film script about him, I went off and interviewed various people including Charlie's, Charlie's daughter, who put me on to other people. I realised there were other stories about Charlie before and after the war, which were just as fascinating as the war record. Not quite as bloody, obviously, but mm. still intriguing. So I wanted to try and... It's an essay on courage and an essay on, on moral courage as well. Yeah, yeah, almost a character study more so than yeah. a biography. Would that yeah, be fair? Yeah, that'd be correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So why is, the, why is the story... I mean, there, there's obvious answers to this, but why is this story so important to New Zealand? Well, one, possibly the bravest man who ever lived was a New Zealander. New Zealanders went to war the same way that Zin Zan Brook played rugby and Richie McCaw dived into malls. You sort of see that same kind of reckless physical courage. And when I was doing the research, I came across a, a speech that Kippenberger gave to a Canadian RSA, whatever they call him, a different name. Mm. And he said that when, when he was back in Egypt after the debacle on Crete, and they were trying to pick out pieces from the records, you know, if we can hand out some medals and we can get some glory out of this, after the New Zealand-led defence of Crete was bungled by the Kiwis, so we lost Crete because of command failures from New Zealand generals, really, mm. and they let down the courage of the men beneath them. And when they got back to, to Egypt, he started talking to people about what Charlie had done. He said it became very quickly became clear that Charlie had rated 12 military crosses or three VCs on Crete alone. That's staggering. 12 mm. military crosses or three VCs. And they weren't going to give him three VCs, but they had to give him one. And then in North Africa, a British general who wrote a book on the VC, General Sir de la Billiere, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, he said that Charlie was responsible for five more acts of conspicuous gallantry under enemy fire mm. in North Africa. And the threshold for a VC is a conspicuous act of gallantry under enemy fire and Charlie was did was five, five of those and at Mimkwakwiem and at Rewazit Ridge and I thought that's eight VCs in all. Eight VCs and it was the hardest medal to win anyway, yes. the highest threshold and the most well regarded mm. and to win eight VCs or be, be liable for eight VCs is absolutely staggering. I thought this is a story every New Zealander should know and possibly a few other people as well because maybe the bravest man that ever lived was a unassuming, shy, modest, retiring Kaikoura farmer, you know. Yeah, the quintessential Kiwi bloke. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, and there's, there, in the book I came across some nice quotes from an Australian, which makes it even more credible because, you know, they don't hand out praise in New Zealanders lightly. And Alan Moorhead describes the New Zealanders in the Western Desert and almost brought tears to my eyes to read his description. He said, to watch the New Zealand coming towards you, you knew you were watching the finest outflanking soldiers Mm. And so they were the best infantry soldiers in North Africa. By common consent, they were the finest infantry fighters in North Africa. Yeah. And I think Montgomery said something similar, and certainly Rommel said something similar. Mm. And the other thing which staggered me, when I was talking to John Clark and his, in Australia, the late Fred Dagg, we were having coffee in Melbourne, and they said, I wanted to... I just read a book explaining evil by an American journalist called Ron Rosenbaum, who went to examine the source of Hitler's evil. Mm. Terrific, brilliant book, well worth reading. Anyone, everyone should read it. It's a staggering book of scholarship and research. And I said to, to John, I'd love to be able to do a book and try to explain where Charlie's courage came from. Mm -hmm. And John said, oh, you know about his death notices, don't you? And I said, no. He said, I'll send it to you. 
and there were three or four deaf notices in the Christchurch press, one from Molly and the girls in memory of a loving husband and loving father, one from his old mates in the New Zealand army, and a third one from the Greek and Crete community for his contributions to their, to their defence and liberty, and the fourth one which was staggering in memory of the finest of soldiers and the best of men from former members of the Africa Corps. The Germans put a death notice in the paper yeah, yeah. for Charlie and John said, they've got to be pretty flash to Germans. It was in the same paper the same day as the family said, the Germans, they're, they're pretty good. They must have had someone watching. They would have known that Charlie wasn't well and they had someone watching, keeping an eye on things. And as soon as he died, the word went through to, to Munich or wherever it was, or Hamburg, I think, where the headquarters of this particular German RSA is and they had a, a death notice in the paper within, within you know, had it, had it ready within hours. Yeah, yeah. So the Germans paid him the highest con con uh, salute as well. Yeah, yeah. And he was the finest of soldiers and the best of men, so. Absolutely, absolutely. So what, you obviously did this in a short period of time. Like, I know that you've been, I guess, had this book concept for quite some time, but from the time that you left on post to, mm to now seems like quite a short time to pump yeah, out it was a about book. a year about a year really yeah, yeah. so obviously what, what were the highlights of that trip of, the, of your trips around the world because obviously you did quite a bit of uh, travel to uh, yeah i research. did and it was um well i tried to put myself under the some similar sort of pressure as <laughs> as they would have been you know except i had luxury hotel i mean i felt sorry for myself in crete i had a terribly cold dark hotel room and my laundry wasn't changed and i felt very sorry for myself and i thought good god these guys slept in olive groves just down the road, they were sleeping under olive trees on hard ground. Yeah. What am I moaning about? Uh, the, the, the most touching moments were the, definitely the war cemeteries. Yes. The New Zealand's war cemetery at Suda Bay, and you walk down these, these gravestones, and there's a fern leaf butter emblem straight off the, you know, the, we all seen that butter leaf off the all black jersey and mm. the butter, and there it is carved into white marble, and there's the names of New Zealand boys, and I, I noticed their ages, and almost all of them were younger than my own sons are. Yes. And they always will be, and that was very moving. And you, at the gate, there was a list of all the war dead there, and you think, and the New Zealanders are disproportionately represented. There were more New Zealanders died than, um, and they didn't outnumber every other nation defending Crete. Mm. They just died in large numbers because they were right at the very thick of the battle. It's one of those things that just hit home. You have to tra travel and visit there before yeah. that type of thing hits home. Yeah. yeah. Also, I, I had no idea how big Crete was too. I, I, th I thought mm. it was. Mm you know, a tiny <laughs> island, it's not at all. There's a great mountain range covered in snow in the middle of summer. Yeah, yeah. And quite a long, and I walked over the battlefields and gosh, I mean, there were just, there were buttercups and gullies and creeks and stuff. You could have twisted your ankle. I would have twisted my ankle about five minutes in on to the advance on the airport. I'd have been, you know, I'd have been saved by my own physical clumsiness, but it's, it's a huge place. And I went to Svaki where they were, you know, the boats came to pick them up. Yeah. And well, it, just to be see how big the battlefields were was also was amazing, and, and Kaldus was also amazing. I, I loved going to all of those places and mm. seeing mm. for myself what where Charlie had been. Yeah, mm. yeah. So back to the back to the book and up him as a as a hero as a a, a person. Mm. Um, he was he's always been portrayed as someone who is modest, um, always talking about the other people around him, talking mm. them up. Um, a shy character, downplaying his achievements. Yeah. Um, yet he also has a mischievous or almost anarchic side to him. Well, that, he was. Yes, he was. Out. So you it's, capture that in the book. Is um, it? Is that a calc Do you think that's a calculated leadership style that he took, or no, do you think I, that was I, I think that was innate and ingrained in him. Right. And uh, deeply, so it was so persistent and so consistent. Mm. That I don't think he could have, he couldn't have been a mask he put on occasionally. He was wired that way, even as a boy, I think. Mm. And and but that naughty side of him, Charlie's daughter Amanda put me on to his next door neighbour Frank Wilder, who told me a great story about Charlie as a schoolboy. He was held in detention in one of the boarding houses, and the headmaster was across the corridor at his desk, or well, not the headmaster, the housemaster. Mm. And Charlie and the boys are writing out lines and a stupid exercise while other boys are outside laughing and playing and. Hagley Park and Charlie went and snuck over to the window, ducked out the window, clambered up the drain pipe up the side of the building, also a bit of ivy but it's mostly the drain pipe, and put plugs in all the sinks and hand basins and turned on the taps mm. and then came slithering down and got back into his desk as if nothing had happened mm. and then 
the teacher drop, 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 coming through the ceiling as all the hen bases started to overflow. The next minute, <laughs> there was a, the baths overflowed, and there were I don't know twenty hen basins and ten baths all overflowing at once. And the teacher came dashing out of his room, and his water was gushing down the staircase. And so Charlie's, you know revenge on what he'd be given unfair attention. He did the same thing at Lincoln College when a, house, a new lecturer said the boys couldn't play their radiograms at night yes. after seven. And Charlie organised a mass, mass protest where everyone at seven had to put their radiograms on and as loud as possible and lock their doors. And he went running down the corridor screaming at this mixture of jazz and classical music all competing. And no one answered the door. He went in a state of rage. Charlie organised this mass protest. He went back to his room and Charlie had also organised, he opened his door and there were lambs and piglets in his room who would shat all over his bed and everything. So he, Charlie was, Charlie did have, a, he's a right, right, he had a naughty side to him. Yeah, yeah. And I love the way when he was writing home to his parents, his letters, he'd sometimes say, don't expect me for a fortnight or so, I've got lots of things to sort out here. Yeah, yeah, and the have got a few was scores reading, to settle. <laughs> few, yeah, yeah. And he, he would also march up and down the parade ground measuring out the, the steps, stepping across the playground, making notes in the book like he was a surveyor. And they'd come running out demanding to look at his notebook and he w refused to hand it over and then finally he grabbed it off him and there'd be a, a, a palm tree on a, on a coral atoll yeah. in a desert island with a one palm tree and a X, and the X was marked treasure. Yeah, yeah. So this is all just designed to annoy and, and frustrate his, his, the Germans. Yeah, yeah I, I, I me personally, when I was reading the book, I, I wondered whether, perhaps, and I don't know whether this was deliberate by you, but, but, but maybe it was about um, ensuring that uh, he was leading from the front and that he always had a sort of a, an aspect of morale for the for the men around him. Maybe I, that, that was because because there's two sides to him are completely opposite. You know, you had mm. someone who was completely shy and unassuming and didn't want a bar of sort of attention, and then he's this ultra attention seeking person that maybe he did it because because it was something that upped the morale for the rest of the people around him. I, I but he know. was very mindful of his men's morale. He wasn't yeah, shy with yeah, his men. Was. In an RSA, over a few, after a few drinks, Charlie could be loquacious and chatty with the best of them, but yeah. he really felt he had to trust the audience. Yeah. A, I was very lucky. I walked into a second hand bookshop in Newtown and picked out one book and it said Freiburg Circus. And I thought, what? what? <laughs> and I, I, I've been for the last 20 years I've been scouring bookshops and pulling out books on looking for things about Charlie and I look straight up at the index and there's up and I go straight to it and there's a guy who was in hospital in Helwan camp after the Creek campaign getting treated for sinus problems same as Charlie had and he wrote a beautiful tender description of Charlie lying in bed recovering from his surgery mm. and all his, all his men coming to see him and how much and he said it was obvious how much he loved them and how much they loved him and it's a lovely passage about and he said I hope that I could be as good as leader as Charlie, and he describes Charlie, captures Charlie's leadership style, that the men adored him. Mm, mm, yeah, it was very yeah. clear. So we'll move on to your, to your writing style. One thing that, that, that got me when reading the book was that you write in a very casual, almost jovial style, mm. but from, from time to time, and almost out of nowhere, you have these jarring passages of just bringing everyone back, or bringing myself back, to, to showing that war is a, is a, a horrendous thing. Um, well, is that we, deliberate in terms of? Yeah. Well, you're very. You're, it's just. It's a good. Good observation. That's exactly. It. That was. That was planned. That yeah. I wanted it to be readable and light, and, and as many funny stories as I could find. Mm. About like the letting the animals out of the Cairo Zoo. Yeah, yeah. I'd heard that. I wondered if it, I always wondered if it was just a myth. Yeah. But no, it actually happened. I've got, got I've got it from two sources now. Yeah. They, you know, letting the monkeys out of the cage and then putting the keepers in, and then letting the most dangerous animal in Africa out, the <laughs> the hippo, and yes. riding. We saw a New Zealand soldier riding a hippo down the main, digging his heels into its flanks and jabbing it with his bayonet and riding a hippo down the street in Cairo. Yeah. That's a Steven Spielberg moment in a movie, isn't Very it? Very much so. So I, I love putting those that sort of comedy in, and then but every now and again you need to remind people with it. You need to hit them across the face. Slap. War is vile and disgusting, and the worst possible way to sort out human mm. human problems. But sometimes it's absolutely brutally necessary, and I that's why I went up to Lithuania with my Lithuanian daughter-in-law to. And when I got to Lithuania in Vilnius, the capital, mm. where Napoleon's armies all all died on the retreat from Moscow. And then the gym, it's full of Jewish cemeteries. And I went to the 
Jewish museum and and the, the first-hand accounts of the Holocaust, it's, you know, how brutal the, the Germans had been to the Lithuanian Jews. And Charlie knew about that stuff. And he just wanted to remind people why this was a war that had to be fought. Yeah. This was not, it wasn't just bloodthirsty New Zealanders, oh, I want to go overseas so I can lose my virginity in Cairo mm. and maybe shoot a few people. No, they were fighting a monstrous evil that had to be stopped. Mm. 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 And I've always been, um, that's one of my big passions about World War II is, is one is the scale of the evil, the, the mechanisation of death yes. and the, 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 the evil Nazi regime and Charlie, Charlie understood that and um, it reinforces when he finally got out of Colditz and he joined up with the Americans for a while which is also staggering, mm. how do you get let out of a prisoner of war camp and everyone else just gets on trucks and hurdles across Germany to an airfield to fly back to Dakotas, to, to England. And then Charlie's gone down the road and signed up with the, the Americans, and he's wearing an American battle dress, American boots, and an American helmet, and suits up and goes back in. Yeah, and go, <laughs> tries to go back to war with the Americans, and until they find he's missing, and then he's instructed, ordered, he's not allowed to do it. Mm, mm. And then when he gets back to Britain, he signs on to be a volunteer in the occupation. He wants to go back to Germany as a policeman. Yes. And track down Nazis. And they said they decided quite wisely that probably wasn't the best person to send back. <laughs> Possibly <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so with, 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 obviously with uh, Charles Upham being so dead against talking to media and his, mm. his shying away from, from, I guess, having his deeds recorded for posterity, mm. um, it allowed you to have quite a bit of breadth and scope to, to have some space to tell the story you want. What, mm. what do you hope that people, New Zealanders or anyone reading this book takes away from this? I want them to be, I was, didn't really, my father's generation, I think they all came back damaged. Mm. I don't think there's any question that Charlie had post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. And our father was, was an alcoholic and, and lived most of his life in the RSA. And we, we never went and we, we sat outside waiting for him to come out of the RSA and the truck or the car waiting. So I didn't have the best memories of RSA. So there were places you waited outside and that, that bunch of men came back and then I wanted, uh, so in some ways writing about Charlie allowed me to explore what my father endured as well and I've, I've now been able to sort of look more kindly on, on that generation yeah. and, and see what they suffered and what they endured. So it's about, more, more about understanding. Yeah, they, yeah, it's a journey of understanding for me as well. Yes. Yeah, trying to understand Charlie allowed me to understand my father and also the sacrifices they made and and they were, they were, as Americans say, the greatest generation. And what they did was astonishing. Mm. And we are, we should be grateful to them. Yeah. It's been 40 years or 60 years of post-war peace. And it's, they had, we had to shed a lot of blood to get to this, the, the 60 years of peace. So, mm. yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Mm. That's great. Um, coming back to your, the, the, the time frame, how did, how did the lockdown affect your sort of schedule? On well, well, I, well, I was lucky that I'd finished the book by then. It was just, it was all done by, the, as soon as the first lockdown awesome. came along, we were done. We were just writing captions on photographs and, and putting words for the, the back of the cover. I mean, yes. well, this is the, the hardcover book, which is limited to 20 copies a person, people. <laughs> I, I wanted to put some quotes on the back. Now, when you buy the paperback, they have quotes, reviews of the book. Yes. So I thought I wanted to write some reviews of Charlie. and. I found these quotes which I wanted to use. Charlie came across the desert leaning over holding his soft hat against the bullets as if against the wind. Mm. Mm. And that, you can just imagine that scene, can't you? And another one, he emerged from an olive grove carrying a wounded man on his shoulders. Bullets were flying. He had no shirt. His shorts were drenched in blood. I said to my CSM, he'll either get a wooden cross or a Victoria cross. Yeah, yeah. Those are, st those are staggering descriptions of Charlie. Yeah. And the, the other one, he's the ace soldier of the British Empire. If anything happens to him, I will see to it that you are held personally responsible after the war. <laughs> Senior British officer, Colonel De Beer to Hauptmann Knapp at Weinsberg. Yes, yes. And that's why when Charlie went off to, to Colditz, I think Charlie had a couple of physical f confrontations with um, senior Germans doing roll calls and he did things that probably should have got him shot. but. I read somewhere that one of the one British author reckons that Charlie was on the a list of second eleven prominente. Mm. I mean, famous and and important prisoners of war who were to be kept for bargaining chips. Yes, yes. I think that saved Charlie's life. I when I read Mark of the Lion the first time round, that puzzled me too. How come he wasn't shot dead? Yes. By the Germans, just yes. just just executed because he was so provocative. Yeah. And that that perhaps explains why. That, that's one possible explanation. Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. luck might be the other. 
Yeah. 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 Or but maybe he was persuasive. Maybe. Because <laughs> <laughs> he seemed to be quite persuasive. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Hey, uh, well, look, thanks very much for joining us today, Tom. It's been thank a complete you, honor you. and a privilege for you to drop in and, uh, and have a chat to us. Um, the book is, um, is out now. Uh, mm. Searching for Charlie uh, in pursuit of the real Charles Upham, BC mm. and Bar. Um, it's out now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.